okay from our AV. Good evening. Can folks hear me okay? My name is Kate Petrie, and I'd like to welcome you uh, to the Scudic Education and Research Center, uh, run through a partnership between Acadia National Park and the Scudic Institute, uh, to one of our artist in residence lectures. Tonight we will be taping uh, the program uh, for Scudic Institute's YouTube section. Um, we will have a question and answer period afterwards. Our artist in residence tonight is Jennifer Boer, uh, who has quite an interesting project going on in the area, and I will let her describe that. We have an artist in residence program that operates year round. Uh, for 2015, we have 17 artists in residence uh, working in different mediums. Uh, pretty much everything except dance this year. Poetry, writing, sculpture, printmaking, as painting and photography. If folks have uh, questions, I will also hang around after the program uh, to speak with people one on one. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. So, hi, I'm Jennifer Boer. I'm an artist from Bar Harbor. And I've been asked to tell you about my current project, which is called the Coast Walk. So, what's the Coast Walk? Well, physically, I'm walking the entire shoreline of Mount Desert Island. Um, I'm walking along the low tide line wherever possible. Um, I go slightly inland where I have to because of cliffs or rivers or property access issues. Um, and actually, walking is a little bit of a euphemism, or at least an abbreviation for traveling by foot because I've been, as you can see, hiking and crawling and climbing up ledges and sliding down cliffs on my tush. I've even learned to snowshoe. <laughs> there hasn't been all that much plain old walking. Uh, so why am I doing this? Well, I'm fascinated by the life of the shoreline and curious about everything that I see there. That curiosity led to a series of still life photos I've been working on for about six years now called the Beachcombing Series, in which I explore the forces and the life forms found on the shoreline. Each photo in the series documents the things I found on a particular beach on a particular day. And the title of each photo is the name of the beach and the date. My work borrows a lot from scientific research methods. I guess you could say I use research as a starting point. In these photographs, my walks on the beach become a poetic transect of the literal zone. And the items I pick up are points of intersection between myself and the life of the shore. It's an intersection between me and the fisherman who cut a piece of rope, or me and a bird who dropped a feather, and also between all of us and the winds and the gyres and the wave patterns that left all these objects in my path on the shore. And the still lives become kind of a plot. They plot all these points of intersection. The missing piece for me in the beachcombing series is that I've been alone on the shore, trying to decipher the things I find through Google and through my network of friends. And uh, I'm really good at Google, <laughs> and I have some very interesting friends. But I often wished I had someone right there to pester uh, with questions. So I've been inviting people to walk with me who have some interest in the shore. These, these are most of the people who've joined me on the Coast Walk. You're looking at marine biologists, historians, environmental consultants, ornithologists, and Arctic biologists, people from the Abbey Museum, the College of the Atlantic, and the MDI Biolab, and local business owners who just happen to know a lot about geology, seabirds, natural history, or local history. Some people joined me who had stories to share about living here or growing up here. And there are even a few College of the Atlantic students who welcomed me onto one of their field trips. A lot of these people I knew before we went out, some were just acquaintances, some were good friends, some were total strangers. But all of them are good friends now, because it turns out there's nothing like spending two or three hours looking for the best route up a cliff and talking about why you love the Maine coast to really bond a friendship. So we hike, 
We talk, and I transcribe the resulting interviews on the project blog, where I also publish photographs that I take along the way, notes on the plants and the wildlife that I see, old photos of places that I'm walking through. This is the Bar Harbor Inn back in the early 1900s and as it is today, or as it was last winter. And I also publish odd snippets of history that I find intriguing or amusing. Um, on the left is Frank Loring. Frank Loring was a Wabanaki guide who had a canoe rental place down on the Bar Harbor shorefront somewhere around where Stumann's is now, back in the 1880s. Frank was a shrewd businessman and one hell of a cynic. He had a good idea of what the summer people thought was authentic Indian, and boy, did he give it to him. He used the name Big Thunder and performed made-up ceremonies in, quote, native dress with an ostrich feather headdress and a boa constrictor sash, which you can see right there, made, of course, you know, from native Maine ostriches and boa constrictors. <laughs> um, on the other side, this is one of my favorite stories, maybe because I'm a little cynical. So when the Spanish-American War started in February of 1898, people up here were afraid that Spain would attack Bar Harbor. The Defense Department doesn't seem to have been all that concerned, but some fairly influential people lived or summered here. So in June, the department dug up four old Civil War era cannon and shipped them to Maine. One went to Schooner Head. It was a 10-foot long cast iron cannon. They had to widen and brace the bridge to the island just to bring it over. They had to widen the road in places. They hauled it all the way up to the front lawn of the Hale Estate at the tip of Schooner Head and they built a substantial platform for it. The whole process wasn't finished until October. The war ended in August. So when the government offered to remove the gun, now that the war was long over, Mr. Hale apparently felt they had done quite enough damage to his road and to his lawn, so it stayed on Schooner Head and became something of a tourist attraction. They made postcards of it. People would go there and have their photos taken with the cannon. It was eventually hauled off for scrap as part of the war effort in the 1940s. These are shots, uh, stills, from a silent movie called Queen of the Sea that was shot on Sand Beach in 1917. If you're familiar with the area, you might recognize the beehive in the background behind this night. There were, ni there were knights, there were Vikings, there were mermaids. They built a cavern of despair right next to the stairs up to the parking lot. Some of the photos I found were publicity stills. Others, as you can see, were of the cast horsing around in between takes. The little girl in the bottom photo on the left there, she turned out to be a local kid who had won a contest to be part of the movie, and it turns out she was the great aunt of one of my friends. Um, right, so back to the coast walk. <laughs> I started walking on January 1st at the bar um, in Bar Harbor, for those of you who aren't as familiar with the island, uh, with George and Neptune of the Abbey Museum and Jane Disney of the Biolab as companions, and I've been traveling clockwise around the island. As best I can calculate, the journey will cover about 120 miles, including Somme Sound, and I expect it to take about two and a half more years. I know that sounds like a really long time for a relatively short distance, but it isn't just the walking that takes so much time. First, I have to get permission from landowners, so I go through the town property tax maps to find out who owns what. The map on the left is a portion of Bar Harbor's tax map. The town makes these all available online. Um, all towns have this resource, and it's public information. Each lot marked on the map has a number, and you can look up the numbers in a separate database to find the owner's names. I keep track by writing them on the map, but I blurred them out for this shot. Uh, then I call friends and find out who they know. And when I can get an introduction that way, it's been about 95% successful. Most people say yes to their friends. When their friends say, hey, I have this friend who's an artist. Uh, when my network of friends comes up blank, I write letters to the property owners. That's been pretty successful, too. I've only had three people turn me down flat. <laughs> but that's very slow. Snail mail. Snail mail is so frustrating now that we have email. Uh, a lot of people ask me if it's really necessary to go through the whole process. There's a general perception that the area between high and low tide is public property. Well, sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. 
And either way, I want people to be enthusiastic about this project, including the people who own land on the shoreline. And I have no interest in being a legal test case. Um, and furthermore, as you'll see in a bit, you cannot get around the island entirely below the high tide line. There are a lot of privately owned cliffs that just go straight down. Um, and I definitely need permission to hike through somebody's backyard. Uh, there were several properties for which I couldn't read the, reach the owners. And I have to say how grateful I have been for the long stretches through Acadia, which saved me so much paperwork. <laughs> I'm grateful for Acadia for a number of reasons. That's, that's a big one. Public access. Um, the map on the right shows the areas I've hiked through so far, and you can see the blank spots where I went around properties for which I hadn't gotten permission. Once I do get permission, I find a time that matches low tide with available daylight, which is quite a trick in the winter, because low tide falls after dark every other week. Then I have to coordinate my personal schedule, the schedule with anyone walking with me, and when possible, with the weather although I'll head out in anything short of a heavy downpour or a full-on snowstorm. Drizzling rain, done that, light snow, in there. Photographers know that bad weather means good photos. But I try to be sensible. As Kate's been told, the first rule of the coast walk is don't die. <laughs> I plan the walks to start one hour before low tide, so I have at least two clear hours, sometimes longer, and I keep a very sharp eye on the tide. It's important to know when it starts coming back in, especially in winter, so I don't get trapped someplace. I check the weather before I go. I carry basic first aid supplies, and I bring plenty of water. You would not believe how thirsty you get in the winter. I think just because the air is so dry, I go through more water in the winter than I do in the summer. If the weather starts to get ugly, and the tide's on the way in, and I'm not sure where I can get back up the cliff, I turn around. I also try to be realistic about my abilities. I'm 48 years old, I'm not in fantastic shape, and I get tired after a couple hours in rough terrain. You know, two hours of climbing a cliff, I'm wiped. <laughs> and when you're tired, you're more likely to slip, you're more likely to do something stupid, um, just as simple as misjudge distances and miss the rock you're jumping for. So I make sure and stop and rest when I get tired, and if it's winter, I have to head home because you can't stand still when it's 10 below zero. The most important thing I do to stay alive, though, is make sure at least one person knows where I'm starting from and what time I'm expected back. Since I'm hiking the shore, they really don't have to search very far to find me. Um, so I know if, you know, God forbid, I slip and break a leg, it's only going to be a couple of hours before someone finds me. I do carry a phone, but that is absolutely not something you can rely on. Service is spotty around the island at best, and there is never service at the bottom of the cliff. I try to do research in advance as well, which might mean a trip to the Historical Society or interviewing someone who isn't physically able to walk on the shore at their own home. On the left is Hannah Stevens. She's the archivist at the Northeast Harbor Library. Um, got all the Historical Societies, the archivist at the park. Everyone has been so welcoming and wonderful. They make me feel really special, but I have this feeling that they're like that for everybody. <laughs> um, so talking to people, like talking to Hilda, often leads me into a line of research I hadn't expected, which is really the whole point of this project. Uh, Hilda Roderick, here on the right, has lived on Seagley Road in Bar Harbor for 50 years. Uh, she called me up and so we told, excuse me, told me she had a story to share. So I went over to talk to her. And she said, at the end of our cove, when you're looking eastward, is an island. The thrum cap over there on the left. When we first came to Seely Road, which was in 1965, the little island was covered with evergreen trees and was inhabited by cormorants, double-crested cormorants. They laid their eggs around in these trees on the shore, and the cormorants thrived and multiplied, and as they grew and ro roosted in the trees, their guano killed all the trees. So now there are no trees. Well, I found that absolutely fascinating. I'd never heard of such a thing. <laughs> and so I did some reading, and apparently it's a very well-documented phenomenon. Cormorant poop is extremely acidic, and when there's a large colony of cormorants, it piles up underneath the trees and kills them. Apparently, a lot of small islands have been deforested this way. Who knew? So, Hilda also told me, um, thrum is a word from the weaving community, and it means the short ends after the weaving has been taken off the loom. 
And so these rocky little islands with some growth on top are often called Thrumcap. Well, I'd never once thought that Thrumcap might mean something. It was just a weird name for an island. But now that Hilda called it to my attention, I started to wonder, well, if thrums are bits of thread, what's a thrum cap? And that question led me into some fascinating corners of the internet. Did you know that there are communities of pirate reenactors who are just as dedicated to historical uh, accuracy as your average Civil War fanatic? That top photo came from a pirate chat room discussion about accurately reproducing 17th century trousers. And the sailor on the right is wearing a thrum cap, the guy up top there. So a thrum cap, the base was knitted of wool, like a regular old hat, and extra pieces of yarn or fleece were knitted into the surface or maybe woven in afterwards to make the shaggy surface. Then the whole thing would be washed in hot water to kind of shrink all the knitted stitches. Um, they basically felted it. The hats, when they were done, were really dense and pretty much windproof, which was a good thing out on a boat in the Atlantic. So a similar technique is still used today. In fact, you probably know exactly what thrums are if you grew up in northern New England, because at least once in your life, you've had a pair of mittens that looks like that. Anybody here grow up in New England? You had one of those mittens? Yeah. Um, the one on the right is inside out, showing you what the inside looks like. And they're not felted when you get them, but you know, the minute you put those on, your hands start to sweat because they're so warm. So one or two snowball fights later, and they're felted. And the bottom, this bottom photo here is a modern reproduction of a thrum cap. So I don't know. I look at that, and I'm thinking, it doesn't look much like the island now, but I could see when it was covered in evergreens. Right, so digressions eat up time. Another thing that takes time is the terrain. It's pretty challenging. There are a few relatively flat areas, like Compass Harbor or Sand Beach. Those are easy. <laughs> a lot of the shore, though, is boulders covered in rockweed. This is probably the most challenging terrain to walk through. I found the safest way to travel across is to slide one foot carefully down into like the lowest point between a couple of boulders and sort of wiggle it in place, and then balance on one leg while I kind of try and find another low spot for the other foot. So that's really slow going. And I have to say, this only works when you're wearing heavy-duty hiking boots. I tried it once in sneakers, and oh my god, I was limping for days. There are plenty of places uh, in these areas where the footing is so treacherous that even moving like that, I can't keep my balance. I actually have to kind of crouch over and use my hands. And I always think I must look like an idiot, kind of balanced, half crouching, half crawling. <laughs> anyway, um, sidling around somehow. Sometimes the shore is ledges, like you've probably seen around here on Skudik or along the Ocean Drive between Sand Beach and Otter Cliffs. Those are my favorite. You can walk up right there. <laughs> um, but you still have to go carefully because there are a lot of slick spots, algae or just wet. Um, and often I'm half climbing, stepping upward from rock to rock, holding my camera under one arm, kind of like this, and holding on with the other. Uh, but even with that, there's a point in almost every walk where the shoreline on the left there says, you shall not pass. Uh, and I have to climb upward. <laughs> Put my camera in my backpack. And this kind of ledgy stuff is great for climbing. It's actually really fun. Um, what's really hard to climb are the, the more rounded. The, some of the pink granite can be really hard to get up. There's no place to put your feet. Uh, and going down, going up is easy. Going back down, that's the hard part because you can't see where to put your feet. <laughs> and of course, in the winter, all of that is covered in ice and snow. In the winter, I wear snow pants, winter boots, and creepers. Do you guys know what creepers are? For those of you who don't, they're kind of like seriously heavy-duty rubber bands with little pieces of metal sticking out at the bottom, and they give you traction because they bite into the ice. Sometimes, in some ways, it's easier to walk in the winter over ice with creepers on than it is to walk across rockweed-covered boulders in the summer. Uh, and I, even with those, I do a lot of sit and slide over icy boulders. And I can tell you barnacles are really hard on snow pants. I mend my snow pants with duct tape, and there is no visible fabric left on the seat or the knees of my snow pants. They're completely made of duct tape now. So when I'm not moving slowly because of the terrain, 
I'm stopping every few minutes to peer into a tide pool or look under a rock or stare up in the air or out to sea, looking for wildlife or examining plants or you know, looking at salt deposits, whatever. It's a slow process. But for me, the whole point of this project is really not to cover a lot of ground. It's to look really intensely at the ground. This here is the breadcrumb sponge, which is an animal. And it's growing on rocks encrusted with hot pink coralline, which is a plant. I know that sounds backwards. It looks like a mossy kind of plant growing on a rock. But sponges are animals that eat organic debris and plankton that they filter out of the water. And coralline is a kind of marine algae, which is a fancy name for seaweed. It uses calcium carbonate, which is also a component of shells, to form a brightly colored crust. And it grows on rocks and shells. You'll see it a lot on, on blue mussel shells and horse mussels. It's often in this bright pink, and it also comes in kind of a really bright, rusty, reddish brown. Uh, the patches that look like lichen here, this is actually underwater in a tide pool. Those are another form of crustose coralline. That pink frondy looking stuff is also coralline. It has a different structure, but the calcium carbonate makes it feel kind of hard and crunchy to the touch, a lot like some softer corals. A few more creatures I see in tide pools. This is a periwinkle snail snacking on seaweed. This is probably the single most common critter I run into, even more than herring gulls, although not as many as barnacles, now that I come to think of it. This is a bright purple sea cucumber that was trapped in a deep tide pool in Otter Cove, which was really weird. I've never seen them come that close to shore before. It takes a lot of patience to get a clear photo of animals, especially when they're underwater and I'm not. Barnacles will open their shell. They, they have kind of a, a double door. They open up like that. And they sweep their long feathery fingers through the water and pull them back in and then close the shell and kind of suck off the food that they caught. Um, so you have about one second, and I'm not kidding you because it goes like this, one second to focus and take that photograph. So uh, I have a lot, a lot of blurred photos of half open shells. Mm -hmm. So I probably squatted by this tide pool for about 15 minutes and took about 30 photos and maybe three or four of them were actually clear. Uh, another interesting thing in this particular photo is all the baby periwinkles. You probably have a sense of how big a barnacle is. Well, those are not enormous barnacles. Those are incredibly tiny snails. And if you look, in, you can see one in the, there's a dead barnacle. Where there's like a big black opening. Those were all full of baby periwinkle as well. They were hiding inside the dead barnacles. This was taken in late April, and the tide pools were just full of babies. So after the walk, I edit the photos, which takes a few hours. I transcribe the audio interview if someone was walking with me. And that is so slow. It's easily the most tedious part of the project, even more so than poking through the tax maps. Uh, a two-hour interview, which is pretty typical, will take me six hours to transcribe because I have to play the recording, type a sentence, rewind it to make sure I heard properly over like the wind and the waves in the background, and then type a little bit more. It's funny, they're incredibly time consuming, but they're turning out to be one of my favorite parts of the project. Next, I research any topics that came up during the walk, like what were those ruins that I passed? What was that thing swimming in the tide pool? I'll try and identify all the creatures I saw as precisely as I can. Uh, and then I write a narrative about the day. So I've probably, I, I write a, basically a photo essay for every blog post. And by the time I hit publish on a blog post, I've done 40 hours or more. So I think of this project as having two parts. The first part is an open-ended gathering of information. I don't know where it's going to lead. I'm kind of, I'm just taking it all in as part of developing as an artist. I find that the better I understand a subject, the more likely I'll be able to make the leap from just explaining it, which I think of as science, to expressing it as art. I can't make good art from stuff that I don't understand. I'm using the beachcombing still life photos as part of the note taking process. They can't express everything that I'm learning or thinking about, but they help begin the process of making art out of information. I think they stand alone as art in their own right, but for me, they're part of a transition. 
I don't know yet what kind of art will communicate the sense I'm developing of these interconnected layers of history and animals and energy and occupation, but I'm hoping that something will develop as I travel. The second part of the project is sharing the adventure and sharing the information with everyone who's interested. To do that, I write the blog posts, and I do hope to turn this into a book someday, although I feel like by the time I'm finished, I'm going to have written five books. <laughs> There's just so much information. I also log the wildlife that I see on a website called Anecdata that was developed by the MDI Biolab. Anecdata is an online citizen science portal for crowdsourced data collection. That means people log environmental data and wildlife they've seen on a map of the region. Um, this is a map of the Coastwalk posts, and each of those dots on the map is a data set. If you click on the dot, a window opens that shows you photographs and a list of the species that we saw that day. If anyone's interested in exploring Anic data, there's a link to it from the Coastwalk website. When you look at the map of the area I've walked, it's kind of cool to see how far I've come. But it's also a little bit overwhelming, at least to me, to see how far I have left to go. <laughs> um, if you're interested in following the post, the best of uh, the blog, the project, I'm sorry, <laughs> following the project, the best way is to subscribe to the blog post, which you can do on my website, jenniferboer.com. Um, and when you subscribe, each new post comes to, your, to you as an email. Um, oh, I also love Instagram, and you can find me there as Jen S. Boer. It's a great way to strike up a conversation. Uh, if you have questions or stories you'd like to share or if you'd like to join me, you can reach me through the contact form on my website. And I hope to see you out there. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, <laughs> if anybody has questions, I've volunteered to be the microphone runner. Um, Please ask questions. <laughs> When you're, when you're out there, do you find when you're looking for items or you don't go sort of with an idea of a specific item? I mean, it's what comes to you basically, correct? That's right. Okay. So when you're doing that, do you find in a particular time period, maybe your eye is drawn to, I don't, I don't know, rope or, or things, you know, do you ever find a consistency in, in maybe over a few weeks that you seem to find more of one thing than another? You know, I, I don't mean maybe seasonally you might find more rope if more fishermen have been out or something like that. But I just mean, are you drawn to certain things do you find in a period of time or haven't you thought of it that way at all? I don't think so. There's a, there's a consistency to the kind of things that I find all year round. You know, there are certain things that I'm pretty sure I'm going to find when I go out. Um, there are a lot of areas where I don't find anything. So uh, the original idea was that each coast walk would be about a mile. Originally, I thought I'd be doing a mile a week, but that's not working. <laughs> um, and that I would do one still life for every mile, more or less. Um, but there have been miles where there was nothing. Uh, it just some, some of the rockier areas just don't collect stuff. But then you come off of the cliffs uh, and into like one of the little pocket, not exactly a beach, but yeah, a little cove. And then there'll be ro like rope everywhere and piles of mussel shells and periwinkles. Those are probably the three things I find most. Lobster gear, plastic bottles, periwinkles and mussels. I mean, is it all American? Do you find things that come from other places? And is it discouraging to find so much plastic on the shores? Yes, it sucks. <laughs> um, the Gulf of Maine is a little odd. We don't get stuff from outside. Uh, our stuff does flow out. There's, you'd be amazed at how connected the community of beachcombers is. I have internet friends in um, Newquay in England, 
and in Cornwall who pick up can Canadian and Maine lobster tags. And there's actually a transatlantic exchange of information where they'll post the picture of the lobster tag and people here will go, oh, that's Bob over in, you know, Broad Cove or whatever. Um, and then I'm always hoping that the lobstermen will think twice when they realize that their stuff is crossing the Atlantic. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's not like they're throwing it in on purpose, most of it. A lot of it just breaks loose. So I don't, I don't have any solution to, to how to clean that up. Um, the plastic bottles are what really depress me. There's just so much, and there's no reason for it. Did I answer your question? Okay. Sure. What made you decide to do this project in the first place? What was the inspiration to, hey, I'm going to walk around an island, <laughs> a very large island in that matter? Well, I've been beachcombing here for 18 years. And usually when you beachcomb, you go to one place, like you go to Hull's Cove. And then, you know, maybe the next week you go to the town beach. And then if I'm feeling, you know, really adventurous, I'll go to the other side of the island to a boat ramp or whatever public access there is. And they're all really different. The geology is different, the history is different, the plants are different, the stuff I find maybe not quite so different. Um, but yeah, there, there, are, there actually are, there are differences in what I find around the island. And I wanted to understand how they connected. Like, how do you get from an 80 foot tall cliff to a mud flat? What's in between? And I also. How do I put this? It was rattling around in my brain for probably three years. And then I went, oh my god, I just turned 47. I need to get off my tush <laughs> and start walking if I have any hope of finishing this before I turn 50. Uh, that, that was the major. <laughs> How many miles left do you have to walk? Most of it. It's about 120 miles, and I may have covered 15. <laughs> mm -hmm. How does it take the, how, how do you become an artist in residence at a national park? Um, the question was, how, do, how does one become an artist in residence at a national park? Uh, there's an application form. I think all the parks have them online, um, and they have a coordinator and I, I wrote to the coordinator and in my case it's a little different because I do live in Bar Harbor year-round and I was, was sort of like you know I don't want to take resources away from somebody who would actually stay here but maybe we can work something out because I'd really like to work with the park um, and we did I filled out the application Kate can tell you more about sort of the, the process of judging this 35, 40 different national parks, maybe more, that have an artist in residence program now. Uh, for Acadia, artists like Jennifer apply uh, through our nonprofit partner, the Scudic Institute. Uh, they can handle that a little bit better than we can with all the federal red tape. <clears throat> Once we have all the applications and I get between 100 and 120 a year, I have a series of judges that I send um, you know, people who paint, I send theirs out to painters. People who write, I find a couple authors to help me judge what we're receiving. And our panel of judges rank everything. And then whoever scores the highest, I call first. And depending upon what we have for funding for the year and housing, uh, I, this year we have 17. And the current application season for June 2016 through uh, May 2017 is now open and for application. Any other questions? Jennifer and I will both be available. Uh, and I want to thank you for coming all the way over here tonight. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, it's been wonderful to watch. Well, thank you. And thank you. again, if you guys think of any other questions, you can 
contact me through my website.